So um, as Ibrat said, uh, my name is Paolo Aversa. I'm a professor of strategy at King's College London uh, in London, UK. Uh, I'm also a visiting professor at the Center for Sports and Business of the Stockholm School of Economics. And uh, I serve as associate editor for journal management studies. And uh, I've been guest editor for a, a special issue, let's say, on uh, modern phenomena through the lens of sports for the Academy of Management Discoveries. Uh, I'm also part of the uh, leadership of the SDR, Strategic Management Division of the Academy of Management. And I like in general to engage with uh, research that spans the border of, of strategy and cuts across different other disciplines. So this is not gonna be just a, a seminar about strategy, it's gonna be about, about management research, broadly speaking. Uh, the, my contacts are at the bottom of this slide, my mail and my social media contact. Please feel free to tweet, uh, contact me, email me. If you have any questions after this seminar, I'll be happy to, to engage further with, with all of you. So without further ado, let's go into today's agenda. So let me start with some brief, but I believe uh, important uh, premises uh, that you know are due uh, today, definitely. Uh, let me also talk about uh, a little bit my personal journey. Then I'll talk about sports data in management literature uh, today. I'm gonna talk about uh, how sports can advance management research. Then I will give a bit of uh, an overview on how to address what is perhaps the most common concern in readers, reviewers, editors uh, related to sports data, which is the generalizability of our findings and our contributions. Then I'm gonna talk about other potential drawbacks uh, of using sports data and how to address them. And then I will give you some additional suggestion for your career. These are mostly, let's say, targeting junior scholars, uh, so PhD students, postdocs, or uh, faculty members in the early stage of their career uh, on the use of sports data for management here. Um, of course, as Ibrat said, feel free to raise your hand or, you know, um, you know, uh, jump in for, with question or type them in the, in the, in the chat. I'm actually not checking the the chat and the, and the video. Uh, I welcome if, uh, if Ibrat can uh, jump in and stop me, but we're also going to take some breaks uh, after each of these uh, sections to, to collect some questions and provide some answers. Okay. So let me start with some brief, but I believe important premises. So first of all, um, this is um, a long collective effort. So the insights you'll receive today are not just my own ideas. These are the, let's say, the summary and the selection of a series of initiatives that I've had the opportunity and pleasure to take along for many years with a, a group of talented scholars, co-authors, colleagues, and friends, um, among which uh, there is um, a paper that was published this year uh, with uh, Fabio Fonti and Jan Michael Rossi in General Management, uh, which um, basically um, is titled uh, advanced, uh, Using Sports Data to Advance Management Research. And basically many of the ideas that you will see uh, in this presentation, in this webinar, are taken from the paper. Um, there is also a, P a PDW, a professional development workshop that I've been running together with Dimitri Sharapov, uh, Jan Ross until last year and this year with Francesca Weller at the Academy of Management. Uh, this is it's been running since 2016, so it's a, it's a long recurring uh, initiative where every year we showcase some of the recently published papers uh, with sports data, uh, papers that are published in top management journal, usually, or sociology journal. And we ask the, the authors to not only to present the paper, but to provide um, an overview on the learnings and challenges that I had to face in the review process. And we also invite every year an editor of a top management journal to, with, that has experience both as an author and as an editor with sports data to provide her or his experience and on what makes a good paper, um, what makes a paper good when using sports data. Another interesting uh, place is the Center for Sports and Business of the Stockholm School of Economics, to which I'm affiliated and, and visiting professor, which is led by Professor Martin Carlson Wall and basically reunites uh, a network of uh, uh, scholars around the world working on uh, with sports data for management theory. 
And uh, this center has um, a biannual conference that usually take, takes place in Stockholm or in the years of, pan of the pandemic it was online. Um, there is also a, a special research forum, also known as Special Issue, uh, currently on its way in the Academy of Management Discoveries. Uh, this is with um, a bunch of other uh, colleagues, including uh, Tom Moliterno, Dmitry Sharapov, uh, the editor, former editor-in-chief of the journal, uh, Kevin Rockman, um, Matt Botner, uh, Rory Eckert, uh, Celia Moore. Uh, you know, these are uh, very good scholars, and we are at the moment editing a series of papers that will uh, hopefully provide a very good guidance on how, how to do um, you know, modern uh, uh, management research with sports data. And then, you know, my own uh, reasonably long list of papers that have been published and also that have been rejected or maybe that never been submitted because I think there is a lot to learn both from, you know, uh, happy endings and uh, uh, but maybe even more uh, from, you know, painful, <laughs> hurtful uh, experiences because you learn what you did wrong and maybe... Uh, you revise the paper in a better way for for the next iteration. Okay, um, still on the on the main premises. So this is uh, I wanted to say is not a web webinar on sports management uh, research. Uh, there is a this is something really important to to distinguish. So uh, in the field of management, there are fundamentally two groups of people working with uh, uh, with management, uh, let's say with management research, um, with, with sports data for management research. One is people that try to use sports data to advance what you would call, you know, general management theory, okay? Um, and these are usually people who target top journals, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, strategic management journal, academy of management journal, uh, journal management studies, um, and your and org science and so on, ASQ. Uh, so, the, their aim is to advance theory and they use sports data for that purpose. So the sports data is just an empirical setting, but they could do it with other settings. They choose to use sports because that's for that specific research question, sports is better suited. Then there is another camp of scholars that actually do sports management research. So they study uh, phenomena, uh, patterns, uh, effects within the sports organization to contribute to sport organizations. So they, they write for the sake of football teams or for the sake of basketball, basketball teams or for Formula One teams, I don't know. And maybe at best they generalize to all sports organization, but they would never dare to make a generalizability claim for companies in uh, you know uh, semiconductors or electronics or, or cell phones. So this seminar and the approach that I'm gonna present speaks to the first community, not the second one. And so, um, so one of the efforts that we'll try to make is to move from the specificities of the sport to a broader generalizability of your findings. Um, I like doing uh, research with sports data, but I don't believe that all research questions should be investigated with sports data. Sports data fits certain kind of questions. And, and also, it is very important to understand that sports, every sport has its own specificities which makes it more suitable to investigate certain research questions and certain, let's say, theoretical domain rather than others. Uh, for example, if you want to study something related to the dynamics of technological developments, uh, probably you know, a, a, a sport where technology plays a minor role uh, is not the ideal fit. You know? uh, it's maybe better to study something like, I don't know, Formula One or ski or, or something where the technology has a big impact. Um, the, the information I will put, I'll bring today are the result of an idiosyncratic journey. They're gonna, it's something that I learned in my personal experience. Um, and sometimes they represent my personal view. They applied to me, they're shared with the, you know, uh, good intentions and with a hope to, that they'll be helpful to you. But by all means, they might not apply to you. And so, you know, uh, Try to consider your own situation and and see if it fits fine. If it doesn't fit, uh, you know, leave it. Uh, also consider that our field is in continuous evolution. So today's wisdom wisdom might be obsolete tomorrow. So uh, take it 
everything that I say with a big grain of salt. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, my, my insights um, can be uh, and will be adapted through time and in different contingencies. Okay. A little bit on my personal journey, just to let you know why I ended up doing what I do. So I ended up, I'm, for people who know my work, they probably know that most of my research is based on Formula One data or motorsport data. Not only, I've done quite a lot of research on settings that are not uh, Formula One, the other sports, and I've done also research in more traditional companies like Amazon, Uber, blah, blah, car, uh, Google, and so on. Um, but most people know me for Formula One. So I was originally interested in this field because I was a, a race car driver myself. Unfortunately, not in Formula One, otherwise I would be spending my money in, in, a, in an exotic location rather than being a professor in London. Uh, but I am that guy in the black car that you see there. So when I was a college student, I was racing for Formula SAE, which, he, which is a, a competition for universities where engineers build, design and build their own racing car. And actually, the students of the some students of the university race it, and I was also one of the the team managers of the of the racing team, uh, dealing with uh, the business side of, of the team. Um, I always thought that I wanted to work on this field because I was interested in the dynamics of the sports. And so when I decided years down the line to to become an academic uh, and study specifically innovation patterns, innovation dynamics, I actually realized that many of the things that I had learned. Uh, for example, in the field of motorsport through my university experience and some collaboration with other formulas and racing uh, categories, including Formula One, would have been a useful, you know, uh, setting for, for my research ambitions. And so um, I started doing research with sports data. However, when I started, started, using sports data was still stigmatized. Luckily, things are not so much uh, stigmatized these days. But back then, people would look at me and say, oh, why do you do your research on Formula One, right? You're doing a PhD, you should study something serious, like semiconductors, you know, um, standard automotive, um, gas, energy. And I was like, I, you know, they don't pay me enough to study stuff that I find boring. I want to study stuff that I enjoy. So um, the, the challenge there was, uh, first of all, to, you know, get my papers uh, in good outlets so that people would... Uh, think that what I was doing was legitimate. And then in the learning and in the, you know, in the mistakes, in the, in the, in the issues that I found along the way, I realized that uh, I, it would have been good maybe to uh, collect this knowledge, these you know, things that I had learned and share them with other people who were trying to do the same. And in doing this, I realized that where many other people were facing exactly my same challenges, some of them uh, ended up being authors of sports papers Others uh, gave up at some point, but we all collectively uh, put together all this interest and created a conversation on, you know, doing management research with sports data um, through the some of the activities that I presented before. Um, then, of course, you know, it comes to a point where you have to package your uh, identity for, you know, maybe a promotion or, you know, an application. And it was really difficult because um, a lot of people were seeing me as the Formula One guy. And as, as we will discuss later, it's always better to be known for a theoretical perspective rather than a, an empirical setting. Um, uh, so um, basically, I became a, a strategy technology innovation expert uh, focusing on uh, in that innovation dynamics, or, uh, mostly at the industry level and uh, looking mostly at the evolution of the industries, particularly in the early stages or in phases of transition. And of course, this often is explored with sports data, but not always. Um, so when am I going next? Well, I am now continuing to pursue this uh, agenda on uh, uh, advancing uh, management research with sports data with the help of all the other people that I mentioned before. And I'm exploring new sports, like uh, fit, uh, fit tech uh, apps, uh, ski boots, um, climbing, and, and many other sports as uh, football that, that I find interesting. Uh, uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's start a little bit with looking at how sports data are these days presented in management literature. So 
sports data are very useful for management research. And uh, uh, on the right, you find the results of a poll that we made during one of the uh, conferences of the Stockholm School of Economics, where the scholars who were there uh, and actually were using sports data um, identified what they, they, were, they thought they were the main opportunities for uh, using management research. You know, uh, many people said advancing micro management theory, others said advancing data analytics, advancing macro management theory, providing science for practitioners. I mean, in general, the good thing about sports is that they offer a type of living laboratory to study individuals and groups. They look like a small lab, however, they are real settings where the things that we observe, the emotions, the dynamics are real. Uh, so, but they're designed almost like as if we wanted to design a lab experiment. Um, I remember in one of the um, uh, recent review process, one of the reviewers uh, challenged me and my co-authors on why we were using, for example, mo motorsport, uh, motorsport, MotoGP data, so motorcycle data racing. And we replied, because if we had to design an experiment, even assuming that such an experiment was possible, it would probably look very close to what we are actually observing in our data set. So, um, and somehow the reviewer was convinced. Um, the good thing about sports data is that they are often publicly available because there are a lot of fans that upload databases, uh, or if you think about the media statements that sports people, coaches, uh, trainers, managers leave week after week about any sort of event. And, you know, probably many of your university libraries, online subscription, you have some database of, of um, uh, you know, news, sport news that you can, where you can download news and use the text for qualitative research, for text analysis, and so on and so forth. They're usually longitudinal because, of course, sports are industries that tend to have some sort of resilience in time. They're population level. So you, you're not actually observing a sample. In many cases, you're observing the whole population, right? So you can take the whole, you know, Bundesliga football or the whole NBA games, you know, every game, every team uh, in the entire history of NBA potentially and run a regression with that. And they're very fine-grained because you have information about single moves, single passes, shots, falls, penalties, anything, literally. And they're very diverse. You have qualitative data, you have quantitative data, uh, you have videos, you have statements that are impromptu. So uh, done exactly after, after the game or maybe even during, you know, for example, for Americans Cup, uh, there are recording of the radio communication between the team members on the, on the boats or Formula One, you have the radio communication between the pit wall and the drivers uh, and they're publicly available. So, um, you know, imagine the advantage of having, of serving an event and being able to hear what the manager think and in that very moment or shortly after, rather than, you know, any management phenomenon that we go and interview managers about what happened 10 years before, you know, good luck in, in giving, you know, a, a truthful uh, recollection of what happened, right? And that's where the biases come in and retrospective for biases, you know, exposed sense making and stuff like that. Sports series per se look more and more like companies. They are very professionalized. They have CEOs, they have marketing departments, they have data analytics department. They are effectively companies to any extent. They, they look at the top line, they look at the bottom line, they have marketing campaigns, they engage with market and non-market stakeholders, and they have advertising and so on. And so, and they're multi-billion and they're worth attention per se. And they're widespread all across the world. If there is one thing that is truly international, it's sports. You know, not every type of car, you know, not every part of the world uses electric cars, but pretty much every part of the world has some sports going on, right? So it's it's a truly global industry. And some sports are more globalized than others, others are, are more local. And then uh, involves women, involves men of uh, of any walks of life, and, and it represents also, as you will see later, uh, a wonderful, uh, setting to explore uh, current phenomena from, you know, diversity, inclusion, equality, digitization, uh, and, and many others. Um, also, once you have a nice paper on sports and you may be trying to translate, you know, the very high level academic findings 
uh, into a practical recommendation for your business students or the executives you teach to, you will probably realize that sports always resonates a lot with, with, uh, with your audience. So they actually make great analogies and great metaphors to communicate some of the findings and make them you know, uh, in intelligible to, to, to your students. The good news is that uh, the amount of papers in uh, uh, top management journals using sports data is literally skyrocketing. Okay, it is if we consider you know uh, sport all sports as one you know uh, industry, sport management sports is probably one of the most represented industries in top management papers, and um, uh, this is just the recollection of. FT50 journals uh, in management, so not all F FT50, between 1972 and 2021, so in 50 years, and only macro paper. So they, this do, does not count the micro paper, so OB paper, organizational psychology, and stuff like that. And you can see like that it's it's really going up and up and up. Now the good news is that with a widespread of this kind of practice. Um, also, uh, reviewers, readers become less skeptical. They become more knowledgeable about how to do good research, how to discern good, good research from bad research. And uh, pretty much almost every editor uh, in, um, in the top management journals uh, has at least one paper on sports. Okay, that's, that's quite interesting. If you look at the, who are the top editors in, uh, in many of the top journals this day, you know, Mark Gruber has a paper on Formula One. Christine Bachmann, I think, has a paper at ASQ, has a paper on baseball. Um, I think um, uh, Martin Kilduff has a paper that used to be at AMR, you know, he has a, he has a paper on uh, NFL. Uh, so, the, the, so they're more aware on, on, you know, how to use sports data, and that's good news, right? You don't have to sell the fact that this is a setting that actually can lead to generalizability. Uh, this is just a a two-mode network that my friend and co-author Fabio Fonti created for our paper in general management, which unfortunately didn't make it to the final paper. The editors asked us to drop it. But basically here in red, you find the basically the, the theories, the, the main theories in macro research, macro management research. And in blue, the square, you find the sports. And as you can see, there are certain sports that are more popular than others, at least in macro management research. And certain theories are more popular than others. And so, for example, we see uh, baseball, football, basketball, uh, Olympics are usually uh, the, the most popular sports, followed by soccer and Formula One uh, or other car series, hockey, and then there are papers with multiple sports. And in terms of theory, there are a lot of papers that are just, for example, data-driven, and they look at phenomena without putting a, a, a theory ahead. These are usually papers that emerged in the early years, you know, in the 70s and the 80s, or maybe are part of uh, journals like Management Science, uh, where sometimes some of papers are purely data-driven and they look at phenomena without theorizing. But uh, more recently, uh, you know, often um, uh, I, um, cognition, decision-making under risk, uh, behavioral theory of the firm, behavioral economics, network theory, status and reputation, uh, evolutionary theory, uh, eco uh, eco uh, popular ecology, these are, you know, um, some uh, population ecology, sorry, are some of the, the theories that are most uh, uh, common. This is instead a connection between the phenomena and uh, uh, you know the, the 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 sports, and we we see here decision making, unethical behavior. Of course, performance is is very central because you know it's very easy to measure performance with sports, uh, risk taking, leadership, uh, resource dependency, or acquisition, and so on. So. Um, the, of course, all the slides will be also available if you need them, but together with the video, uh, you, you will be able to retrieve them. So, however, skepticism remains. And uh, these are a couple of lines that myself and other uh, authors have uh, uh, encountered in our, uh, in our journey. So once I remember I was presenting a paper on Formula One in a conference and a major, an editor in a major academic journal, he came to me and said, uh, you know, serious scholars don't study Formula One. They study boring industries such as plumbing. <laughs> and uh, another acad senior academic, when we told to another friend of mine, Yaros, like using sports data for your research is Freakonomics. Now, um, while there is less and less skepticism, the skepticism remains. And when you embark in a project with sports data, you have to be aware 
of what uh, such you know critical uh, points are and how to address them. And what I will try to give you today is precisely a set of very practical, very hands-on uh, solutions, hopefully, to, to tackle this kind of criticism. Um, so uh, maybe we can take a break now. Um, okay, I see Tom says, is the paper with this figure published so we can reference it? So no, the, so the paper uh, is, uh, is uh, the one that was among the, the suggested uh, readings, which is um, um, the one with uh, uh, Fonti Ross Aversa 2023 General Management, uh, using sports data to advance management research, uh, publishing journal management. I think somebody put the link on top. Uh, these papers didn't make it to the didn't make it to the final version of the paper, so you will not find them. But you can reference the presentation if you want. Okay. Um, so how sports data can advance management research? So let me uh, um, say, you know, sports data are suitable to do both theory building and theory testing, okay? Theory building means, you know, coming up with new construct, new exploring new relationship, expanding the theoretical understanding that we have of organizations. While theory testing is, you know, uh, the, the, the testing of existing theories uh, in an empirical setting. Imagine you have maybe a theory that is theorizing a, uh, you know, a theory-driven theory journal, theory-focused journal like Academy, Academy of Management Review or in a theory piece in strategic management journal or science, and you wanna you wanna do an empirical test of it. So with the sports data, you can of course do both. However, here you see a, a graph uh, taken from uh, the paper uh, by Colquitt and Zapata uh, Felan in 2017 that tries to categorize papers in uh, uh, testing theory on the horizontal uh, axis and building theory on the vertical axis. And uh, through the years of our PDW at the Academy, we asked uh, to the presenters of the paper to tell us where their paper would be placed in this kind of graph. And, and then also we asked them, please place your paper when you did the original submission and then place it how it ended up at the end of the review process before being published. And what we realize, what we realize, and I think it's pretty, pretty obvious, is that reviewers in top journal will always try to push you towards theory uh, building. So uh, here the idea is, you know, uh, it is easy, easy uh, to, to, to figure out that if you want to get into the top journal because of the mission of the top journal, you should try to have a theoretical expansion, a theoretical contribution, rather than simply testing theory. In some cases, however, what happens is that there are some papers that build some, you know, um, some theories, uh, you know, some theoretical expectation up front, maybe with a, um, you know, theoretical model or maybe uh, with a simulation, and then they test it empirically. But still, there is a strong contribution in theory building at the beginning of the paper with some other methodology. Um, so my suggestion here is uh, whenever you start preparing a paper and you have the ambition to go in a top journal, really try to make that big leap and go towards theory building because that will make your life easier and probably your review process more, more straightforward. Okay, so another thing that um, sport sports data can help us do is radical theorizing. So radical theorizing is something that uh, several editors have claimed they want to achieve with their journals, that they're very interested in publishing papers with radical theorizing. So what does radical theorizing mean? Uh, radical theorizing means the generation of completely new theoretical insights that may lead to a substantial departure from existing paradigms. So something that really you know, sets apart from everything that has been said so far. Now, why sports data allow us to do this? Well, because they basically offset the so-called street light effect. And you see here, you know, um, uh, an interesting, you know, comic uh, on the side that explain what the street light effect is. You know, it's like saying, you know, the, you, there's a person in the middle of the night searching for, for the keys under, uh, you know, a street light. And a policeman stops by and says, you know, is this the place where you lost your keys or your wallet? And the person says, uh, I lost it in the park, but this is where the light is. Meaning 
if we keep observing the same phenomena using the same data with the same pattern, with the same variable, with the same, we will end up into certain kind of protocols that will push us to see always the same stuff. Okay. And this was, will probably bring us to an incremental understanding of the, the of theoretical understanding. When we have to force ourselves of imagining that dynamics in a completely different setting, we have to make an additional effort to translate those insights, those you know empirical insights into new new construct, new pheno new um, theori theorizable phenomena, and so it will push us to areas of the theory that we haven't explored yet, or maybe uh, you know cross bridging different kind of theories. And this is something that a lot of scholars have been doing. I mean, one uh, uh, one individual in particular that, whose paper I really like is the, the work by Gavin Kilduff at NYU that look at dynamics or rivalry with a very fresh, very interesting eye and has basically completely revised some of the assumptions that were common, for example, in the um, organizational psychology about rivalry. So, and he did most of this stuff, uh, most of this research using sports data, but it, of course he's not the only one. Um, another very important aspect I think is, you know, it, um, sports data help us uh, explore emerging phenomena. Uh, now the interesting bit about sports is that, you know, especially top league sports are very, um, very popular and very visible, right? They're broadcasted globally. Uh, they're covered by media official and, you know, blogs and fans. And so uh, everything that happens there is is tracked and is traceable. And uh, with the um, you know with the, um, the the broadcasting you know reaching you know um, global, we can see phenomena in real life and re in real time. Um, for example, if you think of you know how sports has um, you know to a certain extent represented uh, um, uh, you know very visible expression of the Black Lives Matter phenomena, right? Especially if you think of in the U.S., but not only in the U.S., right? So probably this would be a good setting to explore this kind of dynamics. Um, so inequality, diversity, inclusion. Think about, for example, gender pay gap. Um, we, the, in many cases, the pay of sport, sport athletes, professional athletes is public. So you can measure the pay gap, for example, across gender. Um, or, for example, think, for example, the you know uh, efforts in ad, uh, advancing greener technologies in automotive and the efforts that motorsport has been doing through the years. For example, when Formula One became hybrid, became hybrid, or the emergence of Formula Electric, or maybe you know the the now uh, um, Le Mans twenty four hours or Le Mans they said they're gonna uh, pioneer hi, uh, hybrid hydrogen cars. You know, and this kind of technological efforts, adaptation to regulation, can be observed uh, in the blueprints of the of the racing cars that are made available after the end of the season. And some of my papers, for example, uh, the one with Alessandro Marino, Luis Mesquita, and Jay Anand, published in Org Science 2015, is about you know the transformation towards hybrid 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 cars in Formula One. And instead, the one that I published with Olivier Guillotin in Research Policy in 2018 is about the uh, you know the 24 hour of Le Mans and uh, uh, prototype racing going hybrid. Um, so um, one of the main issues that you will face or you have faced when using sports data is addressing the famous generalizability concern. Simply put, people will come back to you and say, okay, this is all nice and fine. We trust your findings, but how can a football team Equate to a you know a semiconductor company or you know a tennis match uh, equate to a startup, right? You know these are very different things. Uh, they don't match. How can you possibly you know extend your findings to other settings? Which is something again that in sport man management research nobody will probably ask you to do because the goal there is not to explain a pattern that can be visible in more traditional organization is simply to explain the pattern within the sport. Uh, so as long as the calculation is, is, is solid or the, the analysis is solid and it makes sense, you know, it shouldn't be a major issue in terms of generalizability. But it is a major issue for, uh, uh, for um, top management, especially top management journals. So here are some uh, aspects to try to minimize the problem, okay? So 
Rule number one, avoid to frame the paper around sports, okay? So never, ever, ever start the paper by talking about the sports, okay? Don't make it sound like you want to write a paper about the sports. You have two possible ways to address this. First, either start with a theoretical puzzle. Come with a theoretical problem. Cite literature that has nothing to do with sports, okay? Talk about, you know, the, the problem you're trying to address. We're looking at, you know, uh, equality in the organizations, uh, gender pay gap. We're looking at, you know, pay for performance, adaptation to regulation, you know, general trends and, you know, if it, and, and, and start with the literature, okay? You will talk about the sports only at the end of the introduction where you briefly introduce the setting or eventually even don't talk there, don't talk about the setting there, talk directly about the setting in the method, okay? So try to sell the research question as a general problem before you sell the sports as a viable setting to test it, okay? Get, hook the reader on the research question and then it's theoretically, theoretical importance. The second option, you can start with an with a empirical puzzle. You know, you can start by say, hey, we may have looked in the society and this is a very common pattern that we cannot explain. However, don't do it by starting with a sport example. Start with something that is as far as possible to sports. Ideally, something a bit, uh, you know, a bit more traditional, okay? Let me give you a couple of examples. These are two examples taken from my own papers, okay? So the first paper, the first example is taken from a paper that is titled The Primordial Soup Exploring the Emotional Microfoundational Cluster Genesis. So this paper is about how, what are the, the emotions that drive the acts of the entrepreneurs, of the users, when they start doing activities that will later on become an industrial cluster, okay? And it is based on the British Motorsport uh, Valley, the emergence of the British Motorsport Valley after World War II from lead users and uh, you know, racing enthusiasts uh, that they were um, you know, coming back from World War II, uh, from the, they were veterans from the Royal Air Force and they create clubs that do clandestine races in uh, airfields, okay? So the paper doesn't start with Formula One, doesn't start with motorsport, doesn't start with British motorsport practices in clubs. It starts with the genesis of industrial cluster is one of the most central and debated topics in organizational studies and strategy, okay? Then halfway through the introduction, I present the research question. And research question, as you can see, is general. It doesn't talk about the setting. What are the micro-level mechanism of cluster genesis before the emergence of commercial production activities? And only at the end of the introduction, when I introduce the empirical setting, I glimpse over the, the empirical setting and say, to address this question, we conducted a qualitative historical case study to explore the genesis of British Motorsport Valley industrial cluster in the UK from 1911 to 1970s. Okay, only at the end of the introduction, but the puzzle is on the theory. The second example, which is the polar example, it starts with a phenomenon, is um, a paper that I published last year in Academy of Management Journals with uh, Emanuele Bianchi, Loris Gallo, and Alberto Nuccerelli, which is about uh, the role of catalyzing places for industry emergence. So basically it says, why on earth there are some places to, that have created industries, that have inspired entrepreneurs to become entrepreneurs, to establish companies. And if you ask these entrepreneurs, they will, they will tell you, uh, you know, uh, I started my entrepreneurial activity thanks to the learning and the resources that I collected in this place. But the company doesn't happen to be in that place. They're somewhere else. Okay. Uh, and I start with the phenomenon. I don't start with the theory. The paper in the introduction starts with places have long inspired individuals and society. In the 19th century, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, Italian journey, Italianische Reise, depicted a journey through Italy as a turning point for foreign artists trying to start a workshop or an art business in their home country. The term Grand Tour indicated a practice among common young wealthy European elites of visiting several locations in the Italian peninsula to live an immersive cultural experience. And then I present the question, what are the mechanisms by which certain places catalyze the emergence of industry, but not the local clustering? 
And only at the end, I say that to address to our research question, we conduct a longitudinal case of, uh, study of how Arco, a small isolated town in Northern Italy, supported the emergence of the global sport climbing industry, also thanks to Rockmaster, a yearly event hosted in local. Okay, so it is uh, basically, I start with a puzzle, but the puzzle is not about the sports. The puzzle is about something that happened in the 15th century. And then later on, I have more examples that are more, more recent. But, you know, I don't start with the sport. Um, see, there are a couple of notes in the chat. Oh, okay, somebody's posted the papers. Wonderful, thank you. Um, okay, so second most important point to avoid, you know, the generalizability concern in your papers, in any papers, but particularly in papers that use, let's say, quirky, unusual settings such as sports, you have to explain what are the boundary conditions loud and clear, okay? What are boundary conditions? The boundary conditions are the context for which the accuracy of theoretical prediction is high, meaning what other features does another setting must have similar to the one you're exploring so that you can say this pattern will be generalizable to that setting, okay? So for example, Chen and Garg in their paper on MBA in 2018, they say, they try to uh, uh, generalize uh, basically some findings from MBA about the effect of losing a star player, okay? This is a, something that can happen in organizations. Imagine, you know, a university that loses its its own, you know, superstar scholar because she retires or moves to a different location, a different university. Think of, you know, uh, when, you know, organization firms losing their their leader, the inspiring leader, you know, when Steve Jobs died at Apple, right? What is the effect of this? Um, and so, for example, uh, Chen and Garg, they say, the generalizability depends on the extent to which team members can suspend tasks that depend on the star and redirect efforts towards tasks that do not involve her. So they say, you know, here the idea is, you know, the solution to about, you know, how to address this lose of star player is that you you need to be able to suspend your task that was, you know, uh, uh, based on the star and redirect effort to something else that do not involve this person, okay? This is the, the, the boundary condition to extend the generalizability of their findings, okay? Um, okay, I, I see that there is a question. Uh, where can we get the kind of sports data if we want to work in this area? Okay, so data, sports on data are ubiquitous. Um, I mean, of course, usually sports federations have databases um, the you can find fun databases uh, of results and so on. I mean, the best way to to see is identify a paper uh, that has sports uh, that use the sport that you're interested in, or that and maybe in the theoretical domain that you're interested in, and see where they found the data. In many cases, these are publicly available databases. Now. It might not be as easy as one might think to download them because these databases usually require a lot of work. Maybe you have to do some data scraping if allowed. Uh, you know, um, so you will. It's not as easy like you know, plug and play. Here's the data set, run the regression. Here's the paper. There's a lot of work involved with you know polishing this data, but they are usually on websites, and uh, and sometimes you can you can just get them from there. Um, okay. So, um, okay, so the um, another point is where should you discuss these boundary conditions? Where is a good place to discuss them? Well, there are usually two places where boundary conditions are fully discussed. Either in the methods when you introduce your, your empirical setting. And so you say, we choose this empirical setting because you know, due to this boundary condition allows generalizability to this and that setting, or in the discussion. I prefer, honestly, the discussion. I prefer to keep the, um, you know, the, um, the method to explain the benefits of the, of, the, of the sports settings, what kind of things that allow us to see that we wouldn't be able to see in normal settings. And then in the discussion, usually I prefer to create a dedicated session where I make a specific effort for generalizability. And this section is usually even two or three pages. 
because you know while somehow people think that if you have a paper on you know patents in biotech this is perfectly generalizable to everything god knows how uh sports is that is not right uh, you know and uh, that's a funny thing right if you do something that's like pharmaceutical for sure it's generalizable to ice cream and lollipops but if you do sports no this is definitely not generalizable to other organizations so you have to make triple effort in highlighting from the get-go that you took this concern very seriously, you spelled out the boundary condition, there you go, you even have an entire section about that, okay? And this is an example, for example, from my AMJ paper, we have a specific boundary condition after discussing the contribution of the paper. Another um, uh, rule uh, to help is, you know, use example from other contexts. Um, so try to, you know, um, come up with, uh, you know, examples that uh, really bring the, 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 the findings and the contribution to life. And especially for sports paper, the more the better. Now, one could ask, how the hell do you put 10 examples in a paper when you have 40 pages only, if anything, to, for your submission? Well, for example, in the paper on, that we published in AMJ, we created a table where basically on the on the vertical axis you basically find different cases where this is generalizable and then on the uh, horizontal axis you find some features that differentiate these cases so to say we understand these cases are not identical to ours they have some peculiarities but despite of the peculiarities the pattern still happens still applies okay and so uh, this is something you can find in the paper, in the appendix, in the additional online appendix uh, provided from the web website. So another way to, uh, you know, uh, um, address generalizability concern is provide research guidelines for other contexts. So let's say, imagine you want to do this study in a different context. How would you do it, right? And uh, of course, the assumption here is that you chose your setting, your sports setting, because it's absolutely the best for, for what you want to study, right? The idea is always that if you could study that, that aspect uh, by using, you know, a traditional uh, setting, you should have used the traditional setting. But you're using sports because sports actually, that specific sport has certain type of elements, certain type of data that traditional uh, organization will definitely not provide to you. So... Uh, what would you do? Well, for example, um, you can say like like uh, uh, Bothner at and colleagues did in their paper in 2012, that is based on uh, on NASCAR and golf. Um, they say you know they mentioned that life scientists can provide an empirical setting to replicate their work because the relative ease of measuring status and performance. Okay, the paper is about status and performance. To say okay, we used here two settings. But if you had to do it in a different uh, non-sport setting, this is the best setting to do it. And that's why the, the, the mechanism we think will hold. Another way to address generalizability concern is to triangulate across methods or contexts. So for example, um, uh, Kakar and, and colleagues, they use, uh, they do a run, uh, the, uh, a lab experiment. They use a scenario from real cases in Fortune 500 companies to replicate their findings from ice hockey matches. Uh, and instead, so this is a replication uh, in two settings, one of which is not sports. While Botner, the paper that I mentioned before, runs the same exercise in two sports settings. So PG, PGA golf and, and NASCAR races. Uh, another way is to bridge methods across different articles. So for example, um, Massey and Thaler, Thaler, the, the Nobel Prize Thaler, uh, extend a long tradition of using experimental research and they explore the biases in judgment and decision making using regressions to explore, uh, explore NFL draft data to see whether the biases remain uh, in contexts that in which uh, experienced participants face strong economic incentives. So basically, they, you know, they have a paper based on, you know, sort of experiment and then they have another paper in NFL that basically bridges the, the two methodological approaches. Now, as you can see, um, even some of my papers uh, are not exclusively 
and uh, uh, you know, uh, based on 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 one specific setting, maybe sometimes I explore similar pattern in different sports. And and here you can see that uh, you know, in blue you have the, for example, paper that are about technologies and other about sports. And so sometimes in, I have yeah, I study similar patterns or about similar theories. Um, first in sports, and then I try to advance something extra by using a standard context. But also this uh, allows me to provide some sort of, you know, uh, confirmation of my empirical findings in the, in the sports uh, uh, exploration. Now, um, I also said I wanted to talk about some other potential drawbacks that you may face when you uh, explore, uh, you know, uh, empirical uh, endeavors with sports data. So the fact, you know, people know out there that uh, sports data are very rich. They're very granular. They're very, uh, you know, they're all, there's mountains and mountains of data if you want to, to perform an analysis. So this somehow can be a drawback because then reviewers and editors will start escalating their requests. They'll say, oh, why don't you get this database? Why don't you do this? Why don't you control for that? Why don't you do that? And the point is, sometimes you can do this, and sometimes you cannot. And uh, in order not to waste time, a good way uh, is, you know, when you discuss the data um, of, about your sports context, always be very explicit about the data that you can that you have and the one that you cannot find, or those that you can find but they are not reliable. Let me give you an example. Um, when I do Formula One studies, um, a lot of times the reviewers say, oh, why don't you put the R&D budgets that these uh, teams have? And the answer is because they're not public. These figures are only guesses that uh, some uh, industry experts release. They're often wrong because, uh, especially in the past, Bigger teams wanted to show that they were spending less money than what they were actually spending to avoid the federation to put a cost cap on their spending. Instead, uh, smaller teams wanted to emphasize how much they were spending and so inflate the number to show that the kind of spending they were uh, facing was not sustainable for their size. So these data don't really work. So they're not reliable and, and they're not even present. So... Uh, but if you don't say that in, in your first submission, then some reviewers might ask in the second round, or even worse, they might reject you because they say, oh my God, this is such a poor paper. They don't even control for that. But you know, in Formula One, you can control for many other things, but maybe not for R&D spending because that data is not present or not reliable. Um, another good way of resolve this drawbacks is including your original submission, maybe in an online appendix, appendix Results of alternative models that try to leverage different sources, which means other sports or other known sports, uh, in order to provide more confidence on the findings and uh, and don't trigger into the reader, into the reviewer, a request for additional data. Uh, do we want to take a break? Is there any any question that I can respond, or is everything clear so far? Okay. Everything seems clear. Good. Uh, another problem when you deal with sports data is that people have their own theory about sports, and that's and that's a bit of an issue, right? Because you know, if you end up, uh, you know, with somebody who's maybe you know a football fan or an NFL fan or a, you know cricket fan, he or she will have you know her own, their own ideas about why the team won, why the team lost, and so on and so forth. So you're you're working with people that are highly biased. And they don't look at the data. They 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 think they know, right? And sometimes maybe because it's their favorite team, they're very you know adamant about what they think, how things went. Um. So the the solution to this, first of all, be forthcoming in acknowledging common views about a specific sport. So a way to say you can write, you know, we we know that a lot of people, a lot of the media cover this aspect. Uh, in this way, but actually our data say something different, and this is why. And then um, when you try to disconfirm common views, you can dis provide empirical evidence that this disconfirms such views. So, um, uh, for example, I wrote a paper in 2015 uh, with 
actually 2017 uh, with uh, um, Lord Caban II and Stefan Affliger on some decision-making mistakes that was, ta was taken at the Ferrari pit wall during the 2010 uh, championships that saw Fernando Alonso losing the, dri the driver championship for one point at the last race. And the media kept insisting that this was a problem uh, related to the strategist, while why what we wanted to show was it was a problem related to the uh, data elaboration system, to the you know simulation system that the strategy was using, uh, and the, the system of rules that actually regulated the act of the strategies on the pit wall. So we had to acknowledge first that you know the media had a different interpretation of what happened and then show the data that prove that there was a wrong interpretation. Um, so I see there are a couple of questions. So Tom says, uh, instead of an online appendix for other content, is it better to frame it as study one and study two in the main manuscript? Well, if, if, especially in organization behavior, and it's quite common to use multiple studies in the same uh, um, in the same study, in the same paper. So you can do that uh, if you have enough space to, to fit them. Uh, otherwise, you can have yeah an online appendix. Okay. Um, so another typical drawbacks that you might uh, have is that sometimes we get so passionate about our data and about our setting that we try to over and oversimplify the fit between theory and sports. So we are guilty of overstretching what the data are actually saying to fit into a sports. Um, so maybe the sports is suitable to test that theory, but the fit is not that strong. And uh, so first of all, before starting a project where there is a limited fit, make sure that the theoretical assumption of the theory um, are you know suitable for the sports. So for example, if you are looking at a theory where there is task interdependence, make sure you find a sports where, where there is task interdependence, okay? So a task interdependence is typical of team sports, right? Because, you know, the performance of a striker is very interdependent from, you know, uh, the in football to the performance of a midfielder. Uh, but if you use a sports where, for example, you look at your Olympic uh, athletes in, uh, you know, running, uh, or, you know, there, there's no task interdependence. Each one of them is running their own race in their own lane. So the task interdependence is very low. So, you know, always try to, to, to make sure that the boundary condition of the theory are respected in the sport and be explicit about them. Um, and of course, match uh, uh, them with a, uh, with a specific theory. Or if you have data, uh, available. So if your inqu inquiry starts from a phenomenon, make sure you find the theory that fits the boundary condition of the sports. Okay, so finally, um, I would like to give uh, some insights on, uh, uh, you know, um, for let's say mostly junior scholars, but pretty much on anybody. And these are some general suggestions that come from my experience. So particularly for junior scholars, my suggestion is always, even if you use uh, sports data or whatever setting you use, try to be known for a theoretical contribution, okay? And um, rather than a specialization empirical setting or a method. I mean, and I am really the last person who should preach that because I actually, at the beginning of my career, I was mostly known as the Formula One guy. And that has done a lot of harm to me because somehow people wouldn't look at the theoretical contribution that I was trying to make. And for them, I was just the Formula One guy. And it took me many years to, to, to actually prove that I, you know, yes, I knew the setting very well and I knew how to use it, but I had top journal material. And, uh, and my contribution were not only important, but they were consistent with each other. So um, try to stay consistent as much as possible in your theoretical conversation, especially at the beginning. Because once you have 15, 20 papers published, it's okay if you branch out into one or two papers, you know, outside of your conversation, just because you like the data or you like the phenomenon. But when you have two, maybe three, four papers in your pipeline, it's important they're consistent uh, theoretically that you show also because every time you switch theory, 
you are making a massive effort in terms of you know reading the literature, understanding what it says, finding a good research question, operationalizing your construct, okay? So, and my suggestion in general is have some papers with sports data if you want to, at the beginning particularly, but don't all work only with sports data. This is also something I always say to, say to my PhD students, although they have a natural tendency of using sports data because of me and it's my fault, but don't make your entire career on sports data as don't make your entire career on any setting, right? And don't, don't make your entire career on semiconductors or, or, or automotive or pharmaceutical or you know energy. Try to venture into different industries. If you want to have a specific specialty, it's fine. But you know, as, as a management professor, you're supposed to know a bit of everything. Otherwise, you'll end up being a sport management professor, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's a completely different career and, and, and type of job. Um, okay. So when you assemble a co-authoring team, if you do a multi-author uh, paper, and you use sports data, make sure you have somebody in your team that knows a lot about the sports and make sure you have somebody who knows nothing about the sports and possibly is also skeptical about the sports because it is much better to face skepticism from your uh, you know, co-authors than facing it from the editors and the reviewers. Those skeptical people, despite annoying, they force you, A, to simplify things and make them intelligible to people who are not into the sports to keep the the message about you know the about the sports to the minimum to use only what you actually need and uh, and to challenge you on certain assumptions much better to do it uh, you know before uh, than after um so for example right now i'm uh, you know writing a paper with a friend and author of mine pinar ochkan and uh, she she sorts of she's not very much into sport settings and i like that because she challenges me all the time and I and I had to sell the setting to her, and she's a tough reviewer, internal reviewer. So if I know that I have convinced her, I might convince also the editor and the reviewer. So I don't only you know uh, team up with people that are crazy about sports, because it will it will it will make your job easier at the beginning, but will not make it easier later on. Um, another way to, to to you know might be you know obvious, but you know whenever you start a new project. Right. Follow the best practices. I mean, we we found in the last 50 years, 250 papers, actually 249 papers, but now they're probably above that because other papers have been published. Uh, publishing top management FT50 journals. Okay, only the FT50, 250, and they all provide operationalizations of variable across different sports. And um, and they tell you, you know, if you want to measure this thing in this sport, you have to do it in this way, okay? And they usually do a good job because these are top management papers. You know, they're they're really strong in the operationalization. So whenever you are starting to use, you know, to inquire into a theory, and if you want to use sports data, look what kind of sports has been used for that specific theory, and look how people operationalize it. In the appendix of the paper with uh, uh, Fabio Fonti and yeah, Michael Ross. We present, and here is just an example, uh, uh, operationalization for the main theories that are being used with sports data. So you can look it up and you will know, for example, how performance feedback have been operationalized, how change has been operationalized within behaviorality of the firm, how risk taking has been operationalized, re this, you know, related to the, the different sports. It's a, a, hopefully it's a useful tool that will make your life easier because the best way you can, you, the best thing you can do going forward it's just to to get, tell to the other, look, we are not reinventing the wheel here. We understand that this setting might look different from other companies, but other journals uh, or maybe the same journals where I'm trying to publish have operationalized this construct in this way. So I'm not saying this is perfect, but maybe it's a really good starting point to, to explore the phenomenon. And then the final suggestion is try to engage with a sport conversation in management, right? There are... Uh, uh, several initiatives that you can attend. There's a, you know, um, a conversation of uh, authors and uh, they're trying to do research. Um, among these, the yearly Sport PDW at Academy of Management, which is open and everybody can join, where we also provide specific feedbacks on working papers. 
or biannual workshop at the Stockholm School of Economics. This year is going to happen probably in spring. So uh, watch out for the announcement. And, uh, you know, you can also email me and I can send you the dates once it's set. Um, so I am basically done with my presentation. So um, if you guys have any question, any uh, doubt, curiosity, I'm very happy to, to respond. Thank you, Paolo. Um, I think it would be helpful if the, if you have any questions, please just raise your virtual hand so we can see you. Okay, so Carl asks, um, what are your thoughts about esports data? So esports are great. Um, we There are already some papers published with esports. Uh, one of these is a uh, paper by uh, um, Kenny Ching uh, and Enrico Forti, uh, A1 Rowley in Org Science. They use esports. Uh, of course, it's um, it's really it's really you know uh, unexplored, uncharted territory. There's a lot of data, and uh, there, these are usually very granular. And uh, so there are already some some esports paper out there, and you can definitely use them as as a template. Paolo, maybe I could start with a question as well. Um, sure. In the in the graph that you showed, um, you know, based on that two by two table, um, based on Colquitt's paper, um, theory advancing and, and all that, the papers you show that they seem to be mostly um, quantitative. Is that representative of how sports data has been used to advance management theory? Well, the point is this, it's really difficult to test stuff with qualitative paper, right? So usually when you, you talk about test, you talk, talk about quant. Um, so I, qualitative paper, almost by definition in top journals are, are uh, theory building, right? You, it's hard to, so there's a, let's say there's a sample uh, selection bias. Uh, um, of course, you know, um, I think uh, most papers uh, we, we found are, quant papers with sports data simply because, you know, the granularity of the moves of the passes, uh, you know, really call for that kind of, of exploration. However, I can tell you, I have more qualitative papers with sports data than quant papers. Uh, I think I published two, two, two papers that are quant and something like seven or eight that are qual with sports data and one that is mixed method. So, um, I think, uh, you know, qualitative data can be used massively because of all these interviews, all these reports uh, um, that it's so I strongly encourage people to to also consider them in a qualitative uh, in a qualitative fashion. See, Sean has a, his, his uh, hand raised. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, a question about your slide that was talking about how Richard Thaler kind of used sports as a construct, even though it hired the that principle has already been tested elsewhere. Um, does that does that change your opinion of how early you introduce sport? Um, and I ask that because the theory that I'm or the phenomenon that I'm looking at has been tested outside of sport, but the measurement has been questioned, and the context of sport actually helps justify that kind of the measurement question. So does that change your opinion on when you reference sport or the relevance of it um, within the paper? So for me, um, th that doesn't change. The only thing is, you know, um, there are some replication studies out there. Um, for example, I can think in management, there is a paper by um, Mauret and Ertug in uh, Academy of Management Discoveries that does a replication study of an MBA paper appeared in ASQ actually uh, showing that by including a variable, the result would change. Uh, but uh, the point is, in most cases in man top management journal, you can start with the idea of replicating a study, but then you need to add something on top. So one, one idea would be, you know, if there's a, something that has been tested elsewhere, you start by replicating the finding, adapting it to sports. You show the sports can allow you to test something that in that setting you would have not been able to test. And then you maybe add a couple of hypotheses where you say, okay, now we have, you know, we showed you that the setting works in the same way as in a standard, more traditional setting. Now, let me show you something that in that setting we couldn't show you. Mm -hmm. And so you, adv you, you add 
a step on it. So you're, you, you move from the pure, you know, replication to the advancement and, you know, theory building. Perfect. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Fernando. Hi, Paolo. Thank you very much for this session. It's been really helpful. So the one question I have, um, and I just to give some context, I come from organizational behavior. As you mentioned before answering Tom's question, sometimes we can do like a study one based on sports data and then a study two where we can maybe do an experiment to further, uh, you know, put it in the context of business. Um, I think the issue that I faced is if I'm doing that, you know, sometimes for your, uh, to base yourself on um, sports data, you need to have a lot of data. Um, what I'm trying to see if I have a study one, which is based on maybe a smaller, much more specific data, um, this specifically is like soccer data that I have for the World Cup versus having it for five or eight seasons of the Premier League. Um, if that would be okay, as long as I have a set, like as that kind of shows the behavior I want to focus on and then through an experiment, I could do it. Or if any type of study that requires data, it's a necessity to have as much data as you can. Um, I don't think it's necessary to have all as much data as you can per se. Let's say there is a bias in top management journal editors. And I mean, I'm an editor myself, so I'm both the victim and the perpetrator of this. That when you test something for a top journal, you just don't want a good test. You want the best possible test given the available resources, right? This is needs to be the next edge of testing this. So if you know that the data is available and why not testing it? Because then, you know, the devil's advocate could say, oh, you're just selecting the part of the sample that actually behaves in the way you expect, but you're not showing me consistency. Now, since I know that the data is out there, show me consistency. So for example, one thing that they, that sometimes an editor asks is, you know, if you, on the other hand, you know, if you have the whole seasons, a uh, whole set of seasons or multiple years, or mul they say, okay, show me that this is consistent across season. You know, take samples within, you know, your timeline and show me that there's consistency. Or if there's not consistency, explain why. Okay. So, um, for example, I... I have a paper in industrial corporate change with Santi Furnery and Stefan Affliger on uh, the association of business model portfolios to performance in Formula One. And, uh, and we use a QCA combined with a case study. And the QCA is by definition a cross-sectional method, right? Uh, but the data were available across years. So the editor at some point asks us, can you do it longitudinal? Which is a contradiction in terms like, you know, QCA is cross-sectional, it's not longitudinal. So we had to come up with a sort of way of testing QCA longitudinal with a like variable and so on. And we showed consistency across the years. There were a couple of situations where the years were not consistent and we've been very open about it. Said, we think this is not consistent because it was a change in regulations that invalidates the kind of boundary conditions that we that make those years not, not accountable. This is why we show that they are not consistent, but we tell you why. In the other standard years, these things are consistent. So um, you don't necessarily need to use the whole you know, sample, but you may expect that they will ask for it. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, so I think there's Tiziano asking a question. He says, are you aware of any study using sports data and routine theory, routine dynamics theory? Yes, absolutely, there are. Uh, they don't come up to my mind now, but uh, if you look at the, um, at the at the paper with uh, Fabio Fonti and uh, Jan Ross, uh, we talk about routines, we talk about behavioral theory of the firms, uh, and uh, there are several papers that talk about routines and dynamics. I think there's some stuff with MBA passes uh, in, um, in among the, those papers, and in the appendix, you will probably find your personalization. Any other doubt, question, curiosity? Uh, I do have a question here. Please. Yeah, thank you, Paolo, for uh, for this uh, wonderful presentation. 
Um, I have a question about the dependent variable. Basically, um, like in, we know that uh, firms and companies focuses on performance and that might be um, retain on investment, um, profit, etc. Uh, while in sport context, um, like that there they are focusing on different like the the motivation for the performance is different. So they might be after championships, the number how many championships they will get, how many sponsorship, how many advertisement um, they will get. My question is how can we combine and make sure that what we are testing for. Uh, in a uh, sport context were uh, like necessary would lead to the same be behavior in a firm context for, or for the firm company. So basically, if we yeah. are trying to measure training um, in a sport context, would, would that be the same uh, or let's say general and like um, like a clear uh, finding that would be reflect on firm context? Yeah. So first of all, yeah, it's a very good point. So the concept of performance uh, has, takes different dimension in sports. Um, I also think um, it takes different dimensions in business too, in the sense that we, we always assume uh, that in the long term, every company aims for profitability, if it's a profit company, which is a fair assumption, right? We, we, yeah, we can say, uh, you know, we can think of uh, this as, as a fair assumption. Now, this said... We also know that certain companies, for example, startups, platforms, that in the first years, they don't care about profitability. They care about market share. So even that assumption, even for classic business, doesn't necessarily hold, right? Uh, but let's go back to the sports. Well, I think, you know, as you correctly pointed, there are at least two dimensions in of performance in sport. One is the sport performance, so winning the, the competition. And the other one is the financial performance. In most cases, the two things are correlated in the sense that teams that win the more on the pitch, they also win more financially. Maybe they're not the most financially profitable because they spend a lot to win, but there is some sort of, you know, broadly speaking, correlation. Now, the important thing is not to conflate the two things, right? If you're looking at a performance in team dynamics, you can assume that every player on the pitch wants to win, right? No player, unless it, he or she has been bribed to lose, Right, goes to the pitch to lose or to to, to you know to underperform. They all want to win. As every product team wants to build products that are successful, as every sales team wants to sell. Right. Uh, so if you're looking at the, for example, co cooperation and team dynamics for a common goal, I think you can assume that you know winning the competition is a common goal for everybody. And of course, you know uh, more. You know, resource endowed teams will have uh, maybe, let's say, uh, bigger expectations and more, you know, realistic expectation. But the same applies to companies, right? You know, a, just a startup doesn't have the performance expectation of Apple or Google or Amazon, right? You know, that's that's part of life, right? It depends on the resources you have, the position you are, the market you are. You have different expectations. Still. Everybody wants to win. Everybody wants to do well. Financially speaking, is a bit trickier because, yes, I mean, companies are have been run recently in a more professionalized way and, and financial performance is more on the map than it used to be. But still, you know, we also know that many sports teams are, you know, you know, adults toys, right? You know, uh, uh, yeah, these are... It, wealthy individuals that enjoy spending money or you know or even sometimes doing money laundering and 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 sports is a perfect place to do that so i if anything i think that the sport performance in sports is more reliable than the financial performance uh still you know we can all assume that in the long run a team that is not profitable that loses money will not you know uh, will not survive or maybe the team will survive, but the ownership will change. And so uh, even there, financial performance is something you can explore, maybe in aspects such as fandom or, you know, tickets sold at the stadium, things like that. Um, but of course, the, the sport performance, I think, is the one that has more reliability because we can assume that everybody wants to do well in the sports. Thank you.
Um, so Ying Ying says, I'm wondering whether you see a variation among different journals outlets regarding the level of acceptance of sports data. Um, so we have data for that. Um, I don't think there's much of variation in the sense that uh, sports data have been accepted pretty much in every journal. Uh, there's not a top management journal that hasn't published sports data. Um, I think, uh, let's say on average, uh, uh, micro scholars, uh, so uh, OB scholars, organizational psychology scholars, have published more paper with sports data than macro scholars. Um, because And uh, so journals that usually have space for micro research uh, may have more papers with sports data. But that doesn't mean that they're not open to publish macro papers, uh, macro papers with sports data. So I don't think there is really a significant variation. I think what is more relevant is looking at the theory and the, the methods and the kind of empirical strategies that you know uh, the the journals uh, favor, right? Uh, so there are certain journals where you know having a strong identification strategy and and a strong you know set of controls or solution to uh, take into account for endogeneity is key. So if you don't have sports data that that provide that, if you don't have a good you know um, research design or uh, you know uh, research strategy to account for that. Maybe you shouldn't target those, those journals. I see Fernando says, one of the issues I've found with sports data is they tend to be ex expensive uh, as they are geared towards industry and not PhD students. Do you know if there's any sport research specific centers or, gr or grants available to help acquire this data? Yes. Yeah, so uh, yeah, sports companies have increasingly realized that you know uh, sports are money, right? Uh, sports data are valuable and they're money. Uh, money-making machines. Now, uh, while their standard packages sometimes require us to spend money to have them, uh, I found that in many cases, um, if you uh, email the association and you explain that you're a scholar, that you're working for non-profit, you know, on a piece of academic research, they will tend to, you know, uh, maybe help you and give them the the the, the data. At a, if not free, at least uh, you know at a preferred uh, preferred price. Uh, let's say uh, a pre preferred situation compared to uh, you know what what you would uh, have in other cases. So in um, it's worth asking before paying. Uh, there are other sports where uh, you can find fans uh, databases uh, where you can download the data. Um, they've been assembled by fans and they're free usually or they're open to share them with you if you. Uh, if you want to get them and um, as long as your knowledge, maybe the, the source. Um, uh, in terms of qualitative data news, uh, your almost any university has a sort of, you know, database for uh, news reports and this includes sports news. So that's usually free. Uh, some people, not me, huh? not me, other people do data scraping. Uh, uh, so that's also an option. Uh, not that I'm endorsing it, but just saying. I know some people have done it. And uh, other sports give it for free. MotoGP, for example, they have sector data, uh, you know, performance of the motorcycle in every sector uh, for all the, the whole history of MotoGP. The only thing is that they make them available in PDF. So it's uh, it's painful to extract them. and But, you know, but it's there. It's there, so you can use it. I used it. Any other question? Um, Paolo, maybe one more question before we wrap up. Um, kind of building on, on uh, Fernando's question about access, could you comment on, you know, what's it like to, if you're qualitative researcher, what's it like to approach and work with, um, you know, I don't know, general managers or other, um, you know, elite sportsmen to collect your data? So it takes time. I have to say it takes time. I mean, it wasn't immediate for me to get my doors open in Formula One teams and being able to talk to, uh, let's say, drivers and team managers and stuff like that. Uh, of course, it's very exciting, right? You know, when you know that you're going gonna go up and interview Lewis Hamilton or Fernando Alonso or you know or Toto Wolf. Uh, and it's one of the parts of the fun, right? Being a, a but 
The truth is that with sports data, you actually don't need to do it, right? The point is many of the things that you're looking for are available through news. And in the fact that you go and interview them, you're asking them to make a recollection of something that happens in the past. Why doing that when you have an impromptu you know, interview offered in the moment of the event? Um, so first of all, of course, you know, if you show that you're engaged, then you maybe make a value proposition that is also valuable for them. So to say, look, I, this is a piece of academic research. You might not be interested in that, but I can tell you what I can tell what I can tell you what will come out of this that could be interesting for you. Uh, so, for example, I did a study on you know uh, use of uh, optimizing use of data for strategic decision on pit stop in Formula One, and I provided a report to the team that helped me do the research on how to improve their analysis. Or you know I did a study on portfolio of business model for Formula One teams and the teams that helped me they received that sort of you know an industry report that would help them where the opportunities were for them to uh, sell their knowledge in different fields and different industries. So um, there are there are possibilities uh, and if you make it valuable in their eyes, but again, the beauty of this setting is that you don't need to beg executives for their time. Best of best quotes are impromptu and they're publicly available.